We're good enough to go out and get it in the motor about it. But not so much control in the centre of the field from Phil Kenny as Richie Bennett sends it high and over the bar. Your mother sends you down to the shop for a pound's worth of goods and she gives you 50 pence. You can't get the pound's worth of goods, can you? He's just about kept in. Oh, well, Todd, surely Buckley. To do that to Tomas O'Shea, he deserves to score from here. One of the highlights of the second game. Let me spend out there from the war court today. No more about him. He made all the run. That was it. Put the ball over the bar in the back of it, and that's it. No ifs, no buts. Is there much time left? We have a couple of injuries. Here comes Kieran Curry. Curry leading the charge of the back today. 45 minutes out. He's a chance to score. He's going to win. There's no sympathy in this game for anybody. Hello and you're very welcome to another episode of Treaty Talk, Tom Clancy in the hot seat and joined by John Kyo for a second consecutive week. We're also joined by a man from across uh, the Shannon, from Clare, it's uh, Mr Owen Brennan. Um, before lads, we talk anything about uh, the game, that's big game that's everyone everyone's looking forward to on Sunday. Uh, Owen, I was looking at your face there when Kieran Carey was, uh, when that clip was coming up there, you you were stony faced, maybe maybe that heel has wounds for the people that there, uh, what is it now, nearly 30 years, 30 years on. Well, do you know what, you have to admire, at the time it was devastating clearly, but uh, you have to admire the score and it's, it's one of the greatest points ever, really, considering the significance of it and you're knocking out the All-Ireland Champions on day one, it just shows how far we've come with that being knockout. And now, uh, you know, with the round robin series and, and how that's made a difference to the game. So I think you can always appreciate a, a, an unbelievable score. And if, if Sunday is decided by that, whoever wins it, I mean, you couldn't argue with it. You know, I mean, at the end of the day, uh, you can you can have all the ifs and buts of, of what happens in the game. But it's it's been that close between Clare and Limerick uh, in the last couple of years that if, if that was to be the score that wins it or something similar to that, I mean, you just have to take your hat off and kind of applaud it. So... Uh, we can appreciate a good score. It, it like it, it obviously was devastating at the time. I I remember being in the in, as a young fella in, inside the stand there and or in, in the the far over terrace and uh, it was it was uh, uh, absolutely gut wrenching because as all Ireland champions you're out on day one and that's that was what the beauty of knockout. Yeah, John, the roles a bit reversed this weekend. The are the all Ireland champions going into Clare's backyard. I suppose thankfully, uh, if we if we are beaten uh, from a Limerick point of view, it won't be the end of the road, but. Uh, it's a great rivalry, the, the Limerick Clare rivalry down the years. I, I was, I was a bit too young to really remember that now. But even in the last four or five years, but even it, there's been plenty of uh, hurdles up and down between these two sides down the years. Uh, you know, Clare winning some, Limerick winning others. It's, it's, um, it's a great rivalry, and not to mind the fact that we're next door neighbours. Yeah, I think I think the fact that we're next door neighbours, Tom, has a lot to do with it. So many P- Limerick people working in Clare, so many Clare people working in Limerick, just adds to the whole thing for me, and it always has done. I, unlike you, Tom, I'm old enough to be at the game like Owen was, that, that famous Kieran Carey point. Complete opposite from Owen as well in the sense that I was absolutely delighted after the game to be knocking Clare out as All-Ireland champions. But previously to that, the year before, with Clare beating Limerick as well, with Davies fam- famous leaping back out, back up the field after burying that 21-yard free. And, you know, th- th- these kind of scores, you only have to look back to Tony Kelly's sideline cut that forced extra time a couple of years ago in the Munster final. Amazing, amazing games between Limerick and Clare every year they play. There's the odd missile thrown in that, that wasn't, not even missile, but like, you know, poor average game. But more often than that, in the last, I don't know, 20, 30 years, there have been brilliant games between Limerick and Clare. And, and very rarely do, do you see a poor game between them. They're usually tight. Clare have been Limerick's biggest hurdle in the last five years. Every time they've come up against Clare, they've had unbelievable games with very, very little between them as, as we've seen um, in recent times. And just all of that that builds up and it's build up, building up nicely now ahead of Sunday, which, look, it's it's an occasion we're all looking forward to. Uh, yeah, can Sunday. I, can, I say, yeah, can, I say, Tom, can I say, Tom, as well, that, you know, I mean, people, the argument for or against, I should say, the, the Round Robin series was, you know, scores like that, your lives are on the line, your championship lives on the line. And, and at the time, you know, it was all, you trained for a year just for that moment. And if you got over the line, you have another step along the way. But can you say there's any less tension or any less thing on the line on, on Sunday? No, absolutely not. And there's three more games after it. But this is the this is the be-all and end-all this, this Sunday. Whoever loses will be absolutely devastated. So um, it would have been great to see the round robin in the 90s. How often would Clare and Limerick have met, even at that stage, you know, considering the 
the back and forth that they had, uh, you know, between 94, 96, 95, 97, 98, just would have been phenomenal in Munster. But now we're experiencing it, and I think everybody's relishing it. And I think the most important part of that is is the, the regional grounds. It mightn't matter as much in the in the Gaelic grounds, but it does matter in Cusick Park because it's such a small venue. It's really like a, a real cauldron. And it can be intimidating, but it also puts pressure on the home side as well. So um, it's going to be an unbelievable atmosphere um, on Sunday. And uh, I suppose the only advice you'd say is to get in early because uh, and, and kind of soak it all up because this is the, the pinnacle of, of what the Monster Round Robin is all about. Yeah, the game two years ago in Ennis, uh, it probably had that feeling. But I think by the time throwing came around, uh, you know, the both teams are already in a Monster Final, if, if my memory serves. So... It's it's complete opposite this time. It's it's everyone both teams on an, on an even keel. Both teams trying to put, get you know get early, get ahead early in the race. Uh, you know in terms of getting a couple of points. Um, but the game itself, John, I'll come to you first. Uh, two p.m. throwing, of course, in in Cusick Park. Has the mood changed in Limerick uh, among supporters? And uh, obviously, that we don't hear much from managers and players. But has the mood changed? Given Clare have you know have annexed a league title. Limerick were poor the last day out, you know, it can, sometimes it can take a, a small couple of things to change uh, the mood of people, but are, are Limerick, maybe not fearing the visit here, but, you know, maybe very wary now that Clare are a very, very serious outfit. I don't, I don't think Limerick needed Clare to win the league and to, to have that performance against Kilkenny to be wary of Clare. Clare showed that last year in the, at the two scale of grounds when they were by far the better team and a couple of late goals brought Limerick back into it and Clare deservedly came out victorious. As I said earlier, there've been nothing between them in the two monster finals the last two years as well. And and of any team in the country over the last five years, it's clear that have given Limerick their hardest game. I, I believe each year, you know, the, but once once Limerick have either overcome Clare or recovered from the Clare defeat in in last year's case, they, they've improved beyond belief with their next few games and gone on into the championship. So. I, I I don't think Limerick people, Limerick management, Limerick players needed any reminding of Clare's qualities. If anything, Clare, Clare have probably grown a greater panel throughout the league and at the end of last year. And I think Brian Lohan will have got exactly what he wanted out of the league before the league final. And and, and having that silverware on offer against Kilkenny and, and winning that silverware is just an added bonus. He's blooded so many players through the league. He now has a panel where he can rely on when, when you're looking at guys that can have proper impacts off the bench knowing exactly what you're going to get from them if needs be on, on any given day. And that's what it's all about in Munster at the moment. Limerick have shown over the last number of years where the thing that has got them through Munster has been their squad depth. Other counties haven't had it. And I think Clare really are the ones who have stepped up throughout the league and last season and the season before, but more so this year in the league. And I think that's what's really exciting. Clare people from talking to them is that strength and depth that Brian Lohan has at his disposal. But no, Tom, Limerick, Limerick are fully aware of what... What, what what's awaiting them? I think in Ennis on Sunday at two o'clock, and you know it, it like Clare winning the league, Limerick having a poor performance in the semi final kind of does muddy the waters a little bit. I mean, I think in in, in a sense we're probably glad us talking here and, and general as journalists and whatever else. But isn't it great that we didn't have a Clare Limerick league final? You know that would have it would have definitely taken away something from this weekend. We didn't have that this year, and you know. And Owen said earlier as well, like every time Limerick and Clare play, it's just it, it, even now that they are meeting so much, they are the best two teams in Munster. I think that's been proven without any shadow of a doubt in recent times. And, you know, it's it's the next installment of what has been a really, really exciting chapter in recent years. Yeah, on the the teams, team lineups, we don't have them when we're speaking now. We uh, don't get them probably late Friday or maybe touching into Saturday before we get a good look at them. It's very difficult to know uh, first day out. Limerick have not played for what's it nearly four nearly four weeks now, uh, a couple of weeks obviously after for Clare since the league final. But from a Clare point of view, Shane O'Donnell came on in the league final, looked relatively sharp considering it was his first league game in, in a long time, first intercounty game obviously since last summer. Tony Kelly, we don't know where he's at. Uh, what's the feeling in Clare in terms of will we will will they be going with what we've seen in the league or? Is there, are they likely to go back to these two guys uh, in particular if if they are fit to go from the start? Uh, well, first and foremost, I mean the whole county in Clare and anyway, not a mind Limerick. I say we're we're only talking about Tony Kelly. Is he around? Is he back? Uh, you you won't get anything from the camp. Uh, you're more likely to find out Brian Owen's pin number than than find out if Tony Kelly is is ready. Um, you know, it, it, who knows? Uh, you know, it's, it's it's very difficult to say. I mean, if he's 
people thought he might have been ready for the league final. Um, he's had a serious operation. So I think the two big main concerns were, were Ryan Taylor, who did a, uh, did his cruciate last year against uh, Kilkenny. I think he's, by all, I don't know, like he could turn up on Sunday, but uh, he, he's a couple of weeks off yet. Uh, Tully Kelly's the big uncertainty. You, uh, everyone you meet is, has a different opinion. And they either know he's milkman or they know, you know what I mean? Everyone is, I'd say the, the family are plagued themselves, but they're not releasing anything either. So it, it's, a, it's a big conundrum. If, if you asked me a couple of years ago, uh, Tony Kelly could be out. Uh, uh, you'd, you'd nearly fold up the tent and say, look, we, we'll, we'll, we won't bother going out this year. We'll, we'll try again next year. So uh, the fact that Clare are relatively uh, confident and can win a league without Tony Kelly, without him poking a ball in the league, I suppose, is, is a sign of as what John says there. You know, the, the growing strength and depth within the squad. He's a massive player. He could make a massive impact if he was to come on, He's even as a sub. Uh, but but obviously, you will have Shane O'Donnell coming back in. You know, his lack of league time hasn't harmed him in the last couple of years. He's won two All-Stars, went up playing a league game in the previous two years. So the fact that he's played one now, I don't know, was that in jeopardy, maybe. But to, he, uh, he's a big addition because he offers so much. He's, he's unlike any player that we've ever seen before. You can go back to all those teams in the 90s. He's offering something completely different. He's... Uh, a whole unique player that we've never seen and probably we might never see again. His his agility, his versatility, um, his 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 ability to win ball. So he'd be a vital addition to that forward line, especially if Tony isn't ready to start from the from the beginning, because he will take a lot of the focus away, and he enjoys taking the focus away from other defenders or from other forwards as well. So uh, he'll be a huge addition. David McInerney is another one that hasn't seen much league time, and you'd expect that he will come back into the half back line. It's been a fairly solid one with Dermot Ryan and John Connor in the last couple of years. So you'd imagine that those two players have come into it. There's still a spot there at cornerback that we're just not really sure whether it's between Connor Lane, who is only in this year, having had a great year for Cora Finn last year. And it's it's a testament to the management that that's what they're willing to do. They're going to every junior match, every intermediate, every senior match. They've trawled the county for players. And they've had to find players in the last couple of years. So the fact that they've, a guy has come out, and he was on the panel last year, but he really only made his mark uh, in this year's uh, league, so it's between him, Paul Fannigan, and and probably Rory Hayes as well. Um, so it's a it, Clare would be relatively strong going into it anyway, with the likes of Mark Rogers up front, um, Ian Galvin. You've got David Reedy, Peter Duggan, and the man of the lower league so far, David Fitzgerald, who's got two sixteen from play, and he's not unlike like Clare and Limerick have a lot of the same players, uh, in that he's not unlike Gerard Hagerty in his pomp as well. You know, big. Strong, athletic, but my God, he's able to score and able, able to bomb through as well. So, so um, I think we'd love to have Tony Kelly back, uh, whether he's fit or not, or fully fit or not. We just don't know. But I, I, you know, there's there's question marks about Limerick as well in a number of the players. The fact that they haven't played in so long as well, you know, will throw up those uh, question marks as well. And look, even when the teams are announced, <laughs> I don't know. We, we, you could see more changes to that. So, um, it, it'll be fascinating. Come two o'clock, we'll know who's lining out. That's about it. Yeah, just to pick up on one name, I don't not sure you mentioned there, uh, Aidan McCarthy, and you know he's maybe it's a byproduct of the likes of Shane O'Donnell and, and Tony Kelly not featuring in the league or you know limited amount of time that he's had to step up really in terms of you know big big score getter. Obviously, uh, I'm not sure that the tally in the league final was it uh, two ten or eleven was it? You know, and, yeah, two ten in in the league final and obviously the two goals from play as well. Um, you know, it, it's it's that's exactly what Brian Lowell has, has craved because, you know, Tony Kelly's influence is clear for all to see. But, you know, he probably needed a few other guys to start chipping in with scores because, as we've seen, especially if you're targeting Limerick, like Black Clare will be this weekend, obviously, you've you've needed 30, 30 plus points or 25 plus scores to win games against Limerick more often than not. So I suppose Ed McCarthy has certainly uh, stepped up to the plate so far this year. Yeah, and particularly that league final. I think he needed a big league final in order to to kind of ensure that he would be, uh, let's say, the man taking the freeze if Tony Kelly wasn't uh, wasn't available on day one. So uh, two ten obviously is a massive scoreline for him. Great confidence boost as well. You know, he'd been kind of positioned at full forward a lot of games, was kind of starved of possession. You know, this two man full forward line doesn't necessarily suit his game. He likes to go around and roam around the field as well. He's a, another big guy inside. So um, you know he's had to bide his time and kind of kind of play his way in, into contention. But that league final, I mean, to score that in a in a national final is massive for him. So yeah, look, there's a good headache there for the very first time, and you're and and you're not including the two of our main guys really. You know, Wexford 
did a great marking job on, on Clare in, in 2022. And the four guys that they earmarked were Kelly, O'Donnell, David Fitzgerald and Ryan Taylor. And we're missing two of those. So, uh, as I said uh, from the outset, if you'd said that to me last year, I said we were in an awful trouble. But, you know, who knows when the ball's running, we still could be. But but we just have that little bit more confidence, that little bit of more assurance in the guys that can come in uh, can do a job just as well. And John, from, from a Limerick point of view, for the last, what have we now, five, six years, we, for championship games, we've known who who's in really more often than that. We can say 13, maybe 14 out of 15. Sometimes 15 out of 15, you could almost pick yourself. This is probably the, the, the I suppose, most speculated in terms of a, a team. I know it's day one as well, so we haven't seen them. But, you know, there's so much uncertainty in a lot of places. Obviously, the full back line, we're not sure where Dan Morris is at. We're not sure Sean Finn is really, you know, up to championship pace. Uh, Declan Hannon has a limited game time. Keen Lynch, Aaron Galan, uh, there's plenty. I'm not even I'm not even thinking of there, but there's a little bit of uncertainty with the Limerick team. Now, maybe maybe it's all part of the grander plan, and obviously John Kiley and Paul Connor will know what they have and who who's ready for this one. But you know, it's 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 a little bit different for Limerick this time around. Absolutely, Tom. Yeah, there there are question marks after that game against Kilkenny. Not just because of the performance, but you'd like some Mike Casey coming off a concussion. Fergal O'Connor, the same thing. And talked to John Kiley a couple of weeks ago at the, the launch of Win Home and Adair. Um, he was saying, look, they had to re- do their return to play protocols, but trained okay in, in Portugal when, when Limerick went away on that camp. Daryl Donovan, we do know, is confirmed to miss the first couple of games. There's been question marks about Kyle Hayes. You didn't mention either, of course, who's been seen in a boot in, in, in like before that Kilkenny game as well. Like so, there, there are question marks. We've seen Kyle O'Neill revert from a from a, a man the half forward line invariably into centre back wing back positions in the last few games. League probably the success story of Limerick's league campaign is Kyle O'Neill reverting to the half back line. Are we going to see him on Sunday at left wing back? I'd say there's a fair chance we might, but again. We've seen this so many times from Limerick. Yeah, you, you know the one to 15, but you don't know who'll be thrown in which position and where. There are question marks in, in, in the full back line, as you said. You know, Barry Nash has been fit. Dan Morrissey is a stalwart at full back, but missed the latter stages of the league. And then you've a, if everyone's fit, you've a toss up from between Mike Casey and John Finn. So, I mean, look, there are question marks, but they're decent question marks to have in some ways. Look, there's been plenty of talk of Keane Lynch reverting back to midfield and Darrow Donovan's absence, or will John Kiley give Adam English his head in that position? I, I don't think so for not for, for a game in Ennis, or maybe it will be. I think for Adam English, he did he came on the Munster final briefly um last year in midfield and scored a point and as a blood sub and was whipped back off straight away. So, you know, and, and then you have to look at the half forward line, you know, David Reedy has been brilliant for Limerick in that area and in midfield. As as both an impact sub and a starter, certainly last year, he's probably likely to play in that position if Keane Lynch moves to midfield as expected, with probably Gerard Hegarty and Tom Morrissey um, in the half forward line. You know, and look, Gerard Hegarty, I, I think, along with Cahill O'Neill, again, taking away that Kilkenny, Kilkenny performance, Gerard Hegarty is probably arguably Limerick's most consistent performer in the league this year, which would be great news for Limerick fans if Gerard can reproduce. What he did in 22 and 21 and 20 because last year by his own admission wasn't his best year not not by a long shot you know and then you've the inside forward line you know where, where limerick have had you know and donico dalig an outstanding performer throughout the league seamus flanagan has had limited game time aaron galan has had limited game time and peter casey you know obviously with that red card uh against against kilkenny as well like you, you know so there, there are plenty of question marks within that Starting Limerick 15, but there are plenty of options as well off the bench, Tom, you know, for, for, for John Kiley and Paul Kinnerk to to look at too. But yeah, I, I think, you know, it, it's certainly squad depth is, is a huge thing in the in the, the round robin in Munster. And I think outside of Limerick and Clare this weekend, they, they have three other games that they'll need, need all that squad depth. And I, look, I can't say that enough. Both teams will will be looking bullheaded for for this game on Sunday, but there will be that little bit in the back of the mind where do we put our full teams out on Sunday? I think absolutely they'll have the, the strongest teams available for for themselves, but there will have to be an eye on what's what's ahead down the road as well. Yeah, uh, on the confidence Claire will take from winning the league and. 
look, I know some people have been dismissive of the league, but it it felt important from from as a neutral looking at them winning a bit of silverware. Um, you know, they've come so close. We we, we don't disregard that. It's literally a puck of a ball away from a couple of months of titles. And obviously, you know, had had been um been uh, beaten by Kilkenny in a couple of Ireland semi-finals. So maybe important to beat Kilkenny and then doubly important then to actually win a final as well, if not. Yeah, for definite. Uh, you know, it's Brian Lowen's fifth year and, you know, Munster, you know, as agonisingly close as we've come to it, we haven't got over the line, let's be honest. And uh, we haven't got to an All-Ireland final either in that time. So it was a bit of pressure on to win a silver. It wasn't. For, for for certain, it wasn't part of the, the plan at the start of the year. I think it was, you know, blood and players, see how far they get. And it just happened that the the players that came in actually did a, a quite a decent job. So um, uh, they got into semi-final and it was kind of that test against Tipperary, who we expected to be very sharp considering that they had a, a buy in the opening round of the, the Munster. So they had five weeks, which you thought then a league final would be three weeks off their first game, which would be perfect for Tipperary. So we were expecting a real, real battle. And it was going to be a kind of a barometer for Clare, but Clare blew them off off the, the field that day and then suddenly you're in a league final once you're there uh, you want to go and win it and particularly as you mentioned there about beating Kilkenny you know they, they have had the number on Clare the last couple of years last year was much significantly better than the previous year which I think the Munster final just took it out of them and I think that just shows the not only the strength and depth uh, element to it but it also shows in terms of strength and condition because Clare have been playing catch up with Limerick since that 2020 game when Brian Lohan had a good look and saw and that was doubled up as a league final as well, if you remember. Well, if you were there, there was only about 10, 10 people there in total and during the COVID. But, uh, you know, that that night you could see the difference between Clare and Limerick and where Clare had to get to. I think they made up a lot of ground in the meantime. And I think that 2022 final, once it went to extra time and it took so much out of them, uh, I think, it, you know, it, it ended up being uh, they had nothing left in the tank, really, for Wexford nearly caught them and then Kilkenny destroyed them. So it was important to put down a marker but at the same time, Clare and a lot of those players only know too well. The last time we won a league was in 2016 and we lost the first round in Munster a couple of weeks later, albeit to the same opposition, which is a little bit different because they were looking for that immediate revenge, Waterford at the time. But it was the beginning of the end for David Fitzgerald. You know, that was his final year, even though he won a league. So you can't take that for granted, really. It was a good boost at the time. It's good to have silverware, but it doesn't mean nothing on Sunday. Uh, the players kept referencing it afterwards. You know, if you lose that first round against Limerick, the league means nothing, really, does it? Yeah, you mentioned the 2020 game. Uh, it is a long time ago. It certainly seems that way. And I think you, yourself and Jan were probably two of, uh, as you said, 10 or 12 people there. The rest of us were, were uh, tuning in uh, on TV. Uh, that game, I think Limerick, uh, this was the first one of the first games with, water, with a water break into county level. Limerick streaked away in the, the third quarter, or in the fourth quarter, I should say. Uh, how have Clare closed the gap since then? Like, what has Brian Lohan done? I think that was that was his, the end of his first season, really, wasn't it? That, that, that championship. But... What's he done to to bridge the gap? You know, they've they've certainly picked up a lot of wins in the meantime. They've been very competitive against every team they've played. Plain and simple, they've 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 done the catch up work. You know, strength and condition. They've been going over overload on the strength and condition ever since. And and then the next step was, as Brian Lawn is a defender and every you know a defender of his own, he wanted them. You know, forget about the sweeper or whatever that has been in situ for Clare in a long time. And I know we've used it in the last couple of years, but only in an isolated, only in an isolated thing. But he wanted the defenders to win their own ball. It, it's it's high risk at the back. It's one on one. You know, there's no covering ground. It's it's every man for himself. You have your marker. You have to beat your marker. And against Limerick, that's tough because they they want to create as much space up front. Uh, but it's that high risk, but then hopefully high reward. And we saw that against Kilkenny the last time out. The likes of Adam Hogan, who let's be honest, is only in his second year at senior level, but he's playing a bit like Lohan himself. He's kind of got that defiance. It doesn't matter who's coming on to me. I, I'm going to beat him. Like a, a young man that's, that's flying it, obviously, with the bits given and all that this year. And Conor Cleary as well. You know, they were on very big defenders. But, you know, and Kenny like to play and they like to get on the end of you. And, they, and they, it's at that one-on-one -on -one situation that they love, even the aerial ball. But the players stood up to it. And it, it, that has been the real transformation. Root strength, obviously, bigger men uh, to try and deal with the physical element because we were blown away by Limerick even in 2022, really, we stood up to it, but it, it had knock-on effects afterwards. Kilkenny also one of those physical teams. So I think there was a, a transition in that alone, uh, in that league final, in that we weren't bullied by Kilkenny physically and uh, and got over the line. So it has been a lot of catch-up work. And I think this is the first time the stamina has followed as well, uh, along with just getting bigger and stronger. 
Yeah, John, uh, the, the Nene mentioned there, Conor Cleary, he, he'll he match up well with Aaron Galan from both points of view. The Limerick fans will think he, Aaron can get the better of him, and obviously Clare fans will hope that Aaron will have a, have a quiet afternoon. But the two of them is a bit of a throwback in terms of, uh, we mentioned, I oh, mentioned sweepers there. there. These two neither do see team, teams play a, a, an obvious sweeper anyway. Obviously, at times they make sure they cover half space, but that's an interesting battle. But I suppose any other battles, and as well as that one, maybe that's uh, we should be looking out for on, on Sunday afternoon. Yeah, every time they can play clear in recent years, Aaron Glenn and Connor Cleary, when they've matched up against each other, has been a fascinating watch for a multitude of reasons. More, more so when the ball isn't anywhere near them. I think it, it's better crack altogether. Look, Tom, there, there's matchups all over the field. I, I think I mentioned him a while ago. The, the one player that 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 Clare have really unearthed in the last couple of years, and, and maybe maybe he's always been there as David Fitzgerald. He's been there, but the level he's hit in recent years has been phenomenal, and, and he's taken it to a new level in the league. I just think, you know, that guys like him can be match winners, and that's what I think, as well as what everything Owens mentioned, Clare have match winners now. They've match winners all over the field. You mentioned Aidan McCarthy with 2-10 in the league final. As, as all mentions with Mark Rogers, you do have the likes of what Dermot Ryan can do at wing back at the moment. Dermot Ryan is just probably, in, in my eyes, along with Dermot Burns, they're, they're on a very, very similar level. And I can't pay a bigger, higher compliment to Dermot Ryan than that at the moment. He's just so, so good. Tom, we've seen him a lot in Fitzgibbon Cup over the last few years with Mary I as well. And he's just bringing his game to a different level with each year he goes. Matchup boys, I, I think I think that clear half back line and Limerick's half forward line. That, that's the winning, both half forward lines are the winning of the game. Every game, I think, in, in, in modern hurling. We know how good John Conlon is we know how good Dermot Ryan is. We know if if he does play, David McInerney will slot in there, and he's been absolutely outstanding against Limerick in recent years as well. And if, as we expect, it's not if it is Keane Lynch in in centre forward alongside Gerald Higarty and Tom Marcy. Well, look, that they're the six that will decide the game for me. I just I just think those individual battles are are, are fascinating as well as the Aaron Glenn. And Connor Cleary and whoever Adam Hogan picks up as well, because as as Owen mentioned, Adam Hogan he did a marking job in Shane O'Brien a couple of years ago in the Hearty Cup final when St Joseph's Tulla did 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 an unbelievable thing in beating Arts Gold and winning their first ever Hearty Cup. Adam Hogan has come on leaps and bounds even from then, and he was pretty good at full back in that campaign for for Tulla. Like and he's just been outstanding, outstanding from Limerick's young guns, as you mentioned throughout here. I mentioned Shane O'Brien. Like he's playing twenties at the moment, so we're, we're probably not likely to see him, you know, in in the twenty six on Sunday, you know, with, with the twenties playing again next week. Um, Donegal Dalig is the big one for me. I mean, he did so so well in the league. Like like a guy who who who, who whenever a question was asked asked of him, he stood up and got scores. He's got a phenomenal scoring rate, and even in that, you know, the defeat to Kilkenny in Limerick's last out. He got a couple of points that day that were outstanding as well, you know. So he could be one that may, may get a start and deserve a start for, for the way he's played uh, during the league. As I already mentioned, Adam English, Colin O'Neill is established at this stage. Um, I think Adam English is the one, you know, I, I think anyone that's seen Adam play, albeit it hasn't fully happened for him at Inter-County yet, but we've seen fits and starts, especially the Galway game in, in that draw and the, the horrendous conditions in Salt Hill um, in, their, in their last group game. You know, he he was he was on a different planet that day as well. So didn't happen for him against Kilkenny, but I think Adam Adam is the most likely of those to start, maybe. Although Donegal will push him close, but yeah, just just to come to the finality of your question, individual battles. The one one that isn't a battle as as in one sense is Nicky Quaid and Aver Quilligan. I think Claire have realised that that Aver Quilligan is their best keeper. You know, he's for me he's their best keeper and has been for a number of years. I know the child. Uh, Eamon Foody last year against Tip, and it didn't work out, and that's that's not all down to Eamon either. That it's never that simple as as blaming the goalkeeper, as we all know. But I think Aver has shown certainly in the league campaign. I know that you know he 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 is the man going forward for him, and I think w once you have that position settled, you can build so much off that. And I think Clare have done that throughout the, the rest of the league campaign, and I, I I think he's been he's been a very very good uh, starting point for him. Yeah, um, if we before come for a prediction from two of you now, if a sneaky feeling, I know which way he'll fall. But uh, the Munster Championship as a whole, it obviously starts. Uh, that's the first one. There's obviously Sunday. You have Claire, uh, Cork going down to Waterford. I suppose people are probably quick to write, write off Waterford, but to pick the three in Munster has proven, you know, the, very very difficult for anyone to say who will be first, second, and third. 
this 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 format i i love it anyway since it's coming out you were talking about it at the start on jesus if it was there in the 90s and the noughties i tell you we'd have had um we'd have uh we'd have had some plethora of um of of, of games to be watching back during covid <laughs> there would have been another uh 10 or 12 uh classics um but the championship now it's it's really set up i suppose for for teams with that strength and depth that you mentioned but whoever kind of whoever's disappointed leaving in a sunday by no means gone, but certainly on the back foot because you know Limerick are going to be facing uh, Tipperary, who are fresh, and and obviously then Clare have to go down to to Parky Creek. So it's um, I put it to you on that it's um, it's maybe not a must win, but it, it certainly it feels like a must not lose. Maybe get something on the board, if, even if it's just a draw for for whoever it is. Yeah, look, the, the reality is within seven days of this championship, we're all waiting all year for it to start, and within seven days you could be nearly out. You know, with two losses and. It, very, uh, you know, it's not inconceivable for Limerick to come to Ennis, get a result, and then Cork to to beat Clare in, in Parky Cueve. You know, it's, I mean, that's the beauty of this championship. And it, far be it for us to be presumptuous, and we're all talking about Clare and Limerick, but like, uh, there's like any of the five could get into the the top three. So, uh, look, it's 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 going to be very very difficult. But it, I think that's what puts the emphasis on this game. You know, I mean, a draw would be fantastic. Could can you play for a draw in Hurland? No, you can't. So. Uh, I mean, they're going to go toe to toe. It could come down to a mistake, you know. There's, it won't be a place for any shrinking bias. If you're, we talked about testing players in the league and seeing if they're up to it. You'll never get a better game to find out if you're if you're up to it, whether you're playing for Limerick or Clare, uh, then on Sunday. So um, it's going to be a fascinating battle, but there is a lot on the line for the victor. If Clare were to win, it kind of opens the eyes to every other team to say, and Tipperary would be only waiting in the wings to say. Oh well, if Clare can beat them, you know we can have a cut. They're they're uh, they have a few injuries. They uh, they might be feeling a little bit off, and and we can try and catch them on the hop. Equally, if Limerick to win, they can they can turn around and say, look, we've beaten our biggest rivals. Who's going to try and take us on now? You know that they have a spring in their step going into the Tipperary game, whereas Clare will be on the back foot going down to Parky Cueve. It's there's so much on the line, even though it's only a, a day one of of four potential matches. But at the end of the four. The beauty of this round robin system is that, you know, you can't argue. You've played four games. You can't argue with the system. Uh, if it comes down to score difference, so be it. Like it's how you fared in those four games is, is ultimately uh, how you stand. So uh, it, a lot of line it is on the line on Sunday, but it's not the end of the world. It will be on Sunday evening for whoever loses. <laughs> but, <laughs> but ultimately, it isn't the end of the world, and it's a, it's just equally as important to. To put it behind you very, very quickly, whether you win or lose, and look at that next game almost immediately. Because I can imagine either John Kiley or Brian Lowe, and haven't been mentioned in Tipperary or Cork very much. I know they've been doing their homework in the background, but they haven't. It's been all on Sunday, and that's the way we love it. We're looking, we're looking, we're looking forward to it so much. Yeah, yeah. Uh, John, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll start the predictions, John, but I'll let you be, be thinking of yours in terms of this game. Uh, and maybe we'll we'll revisit all Ireland predictions uh, later in the year. But maybe just in terms of the, the maybe the, the three that will make it in Munster and, and who you see in a Munster final. Uh, I'm going to stay on the boring route and say that will Limerick and Clare will will uh, be the top two uh, in what order? It doesn't matter. But I think they'll be in the top two, and I think uh, they'll be closely followed by by uh, Cork on this occasion, which will be a slight change from last year. But um, and in terms of this game, I'd probably be leaning. Uh, with a Limerick one point win, but again, that's not that's not a, a new opinion. It's obviously been the margin of victory uh, when Limerick have got there in the last couple of years. But John, do you see anything different? It's as we as we keep saying, and I'm I'm caveat what I'm saying, but it's very difficult to make a prediction on this this championship. We could probably all have a fair shot at the Leinster uh, championship, but this one is just so so cutthroat. Uh, so what way do you see this, see this falling uh, for for the season ahead? Yeah, there's a legitimate legitimacy to to saying all five teams realistically, because we don't know what Waterford are playing. There's a Davy Fitzgerald team coming in so under the radar. They should have beaten Limerick in the first round of last year's championship. Missed God knows how many chances in that game. And it's a game they should have won. To me, Tom, I'm actually going to go with you as, as Limerick and Clare, one and two. And again, no order in particular with them. And I think Cork, I, I, I think it's time. You know, for, for them to deliver on the promise that, that, that Pat Ryan has brought with them in the last number of years. You know, if if they don't follow through on it this year, I think Pat Ryan will be in trouble if, after two seasons, you know. But as Owen said, Tom, it's it's just so difficult. You know, as I said, there's so much legitimacy for any of the five teams. Tipperary will want a response. 
from what happened against Clare in the, in the league semi-final. I think it was on their radar to be in a league final, or maybe it wasn't on Clare's, and they just got so blitzed in that game that maybe there's a little chink to their armour as well, you know? So I I, I, th- I I do think that it will be Clare Limerick and Cork, uh, Clare Limerick 1 and 2 and Cork in 3, but, you know, again, it's so, so tight. And for Sunday, again, same as you, I'm going for a narrow Limerick win, simply because you, you can't... This team has kept kept coming back and back and back in, in, in the last four years in a row, obviously, and, and the way they've come back from 2019. But you just can't back against this Limerick team because if, if you have them, which people have over the last five years, they keep coming back, they keep drawing out results. And, and, and as was mentioned here, and it's not sitting on the fence, but they're so tight. A draw wouldn't be a surprise result either, given how tight things have been in, in, between Limerick and Clare. Over time, I said there was nothing in it last year, even though in, in the round robin stage, even though Clare were, to me, by far the better team in that game. Limerick still rallied and still nearly got a result out of it in the end. And obviously, it, the Munster final was so tight as well. So, yeah, but I, th- I think Limerick a couple of points, but if, if it was the other way around and in a draw as well, wouldn't surprise me. Yeah, on. yeah um, I like you, I would probably say Clare Limerick and and potentially Car. I would have said Tipperary before that semi final of the league, but it, they were so they were so badly off the pace that day, and and then the reaction of the supporters was kind of like, oh, we could see this coming. You know, they were just they were stunned really, and it it, it, it nobody could have seen that coming, but they were so flat. And I think there's there's a few problems there that they hadn't foreseen. And look, they've had five weeks to work on it, so uh, they'll certainly put it up to Limerick in the first day, but sustain it over four games. Perhaps not. So I think Cork have been probably the more consistent of of the best of the rest, really, because we don't know Waterford is so unpredictable. But either they're going to play the biggest bluff in the history of the game, or it could be another inconsistent year. You know, for all their innovation, they're missing the basics somewhere along the line that they had with the when Tyke the Burke and all those were kind of dominating and and Gleason and all those. They've just fallen off the pace and they're not really certain of their team. So I, I would. Uh, I would definitely say Clare and Limerick, hopefully anyway, for the for the two of our sakes. And and uh, we only agree on certain things like uh, art school reasons, <laughs> the, the military zone or whatever it is for Clare and Limerick uh, to uh, actually uh, hug each other. But uh, but uh, the uh, as a game on Sunday again, sure. Look, toss of a coin really could go anyway. But just I suppose to have some balance on this pod, I better go for Clare. Look, they need Clare needed more than Limerick. Uh, considering they have to go down to Parky Cueve, they kind of need it in terms of of getting that boost, and and you have to win your home games really in the in the round robin. So it's a kind of ne- more of a necessity to clear. There is a couple of question marks there, but hopefully with the form they're in, they can they can answer those as well. For Limerick, I think the most important thing for them, if they looked at the Tipperary game last year in the opening round, was silence the crowd. Uh, Tipperary got a couple of early goals, and you could hear a pin drop around the place. There was such anticipation before the game. And suddenly the deflation was there before it even started. And it really did affect the players on the field. They kind of sensed that kind of tension and anxiety. So it's a, a clear way for, for Limerick. Not that every team doesn't want to start well, but you know, for them, if they got an early goal or two, could really flatten the crowd. So as much as it's a cauldron uh, for a visiting uh, supporters, it actually was very claustrophobic to the home team last year. And that's probably a means for them to get through. But look, ultimately, I think, Clare with the home advantage and everything going for them. Um, uh, you know, I, I would hope to think that they'd be able to just sneak over the line, but uh, it could easily be a draw. Perfect. Right. Well, thanks very much for your time, on. Uh, we should see you over the weekend. One of us will probably be right, I'm sure, somewhere along the line. Post that, we'll, you know. We'll roll out the red carpet for you, lads. Ah, uh, brilliant. Yeah, we'll be coming <laughs> in. So, coming yeah, in after the motorway, hot and heavy, so from uh, all corners of Limerick. So, we should see you over the weekend, on. Thanks very much. Oh, thanks a million to uh, freelance sports reporter based in player uh, Owen Brennan for his uh, at times impartial contribution and uh, we look forward to locking arms with him uh, over the weekend and hopefully later in the year uh, Limerick and Clare will continue this great rivalry. Uh, John we will just uh, have a look at some other uh, the Limerick game, Gaelic games uh, items from the week uh, that's just gone and, and some stuff to come as well. Uh, the under 20 hurlers we were uh, in situ in McNeville Park last weekend uh, nice crowd, uh, not the, the performance Limerick wanted, not the results certainly that uh, Evan Aftis and Co would have wanted. They got off to a good start, but unfortunately, uh, well beaten in the end by a, a strong temporary outfit. 
Yeah, Tom, it, it was a, it was a very positive start to the game from from Evan Loftus's young charges uh, out in, out in Rakeel. You know, there, there were six points to three, six points to four up, and looked very very good at that stage. They were really motoring well um, all over the field. Really, they were strong defensively, but eight, I, th- I think the eight points in a row from Tipperary midway through the the first half, I think it was at five or six minutes, it just rattled off eight scores, Tip, and, and it really t- turned the game in their favour. Though Limerick got it back to a couple of points after a Hugh Flanagan penalty, Darren McCarthy's penalty soon after at the other end, put Tip in control again. And, and after that moment, they never really looked in any danger of, of losing the game, you know, um, when, when they got that second goal, uh, Tip. So I, I, I think, yeah, you know, and they're getting that third goal in the in, 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 the, in the second half of 10 minutes to go, really finishing the game as a contest. Um, yeah, just a really tricky, tricky performance. You know, it was, there, there, there was that opening quarter where Limerick were the better team, but, but Tip were doing a lot of good things with the ball and without the ball as well, in fact. But yeah, you know, what, what's that? Once that penalty went in from Darren McCarthy, who was the outstanding player on show, just like he was in the Hearty Cup for, for Nina CBS as well. Just an outstanding talent coming through in Tipperary, very young talent. As well, it must be mentioned, but um, yeah, Limerick didn't really have an answer to Tipperary, and that that probably was the most puzzling thing for Evan Loftus and his management team after the game, and probably reviewing the game was they just they just fell flat. Um, you know, from us watching in the crowd and working at the game, we were waiting for that reaction from Limerick to in in the second half, but it, it just wasn't there, sadly. And and look, it must be married as well, but it's a fairly young Limerick team. There's plenty of lads that are. That are just on, on at 17 years of age playing under 20s when you know just out of minor themselves from last year's minor campaign that are hitting 18 this year in some cases you know so so that's a big big step up tom you know as, as we both know um so look that they, they've they've cork up next next week and you know they'll be looking for performance the likelihood is you know they're, play, they're playing non-beaten cork side so going into that game and all ireland champions as well cork from last year you know, so maybe it's a, it. Look, they can't roll out amazing teams every year. Limerick's academy. There has to be, you know, at at times a, a level that 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 just drops below what 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 is wanted. And I think we've we've seen that in the Clare performance and in that the majority of that Tipperary performance as well. You know, you've you're you're asking a lot of lads that are just out of minor grade to make that step up step up to twenties when they've three years of under twenties. To play as a result of that, having played this year, and that that's a big, big step up for a lot of players, you know. But you know, no, knowing no, knowing the management team involved in that in that setup, and knowing a good few of the players over a long period of time, watching them play, they'll they'll want a reaction from themselves against Cork um, next week, you know. And I've no doubt we'll see some kind of reaction in that. But whether it's enough to to reignite the slim hopes of 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 you know getting to that monster final. And, Getting out of the, getting out of monster with it, you know whether that's enough. I don't know. Yeah, it's uh, the top three, of course, are, are the teams to qualify. So not out yet, but uh, no room for maneuver now. We have to pick up four points from the last two games, which are, uh, as you said, they're away to Cork on uh, Friday week. That's uh, the last Friday in April. I'm just uh, trying to catch my date on it here. The sorry, the 26th, and then they've a couple of weeks break then before the final game at home to Watford in we hope at the moment anyway it's down for the two scale grounds so look four points try and get get those on the board see where it takes them but uh, as you said there we can't expect miracles from um, the academy every year they, they just you know I think they're doing a lot of things right but uh, obviously sometimes other counties are just stronger and that's that's that may be the case with this group and then that's not to write them off or give them a free pass but you know we have to be realistic here too it wasn't that long ago where uh, Limerick was talking to win games at any grade so um yeah, hopefully they can uh, as they get back on the horse against Cork. Uh, the under-17 hurling side, they were defeated in Park Creeve last weekend. Um, first night out for them, they're playing at Cork side, who had uh, the game under their belt. So it's a disappointing start for Shane Dowling and co. And um, uh, as we speak, uh, basically on, on Thursday evening, they're back in action away to Clare in round two. So hopefully chance to pick up two points there. And uh, we'll discuss those games uh, in greater depth next week when uh, we have a little bit more from, from tonight's game against Clare. Uh, just to flip now to football, the uh, Munster under-17 football campaign came to a conclusion for Limerick, unfortunately. A third defeat on the trot, this one away to Watford. Uh, equal scores, uh, number of scores, 3-10 thir- three to 13, but unfortunately it was three goals at Watford that did the damage in Leamy Bryant. So Gerald O'Connor's men 
uh, young Chargers uh, ending the campaign with uh, three defeats from three. But they do, I believe, let's believe, have a, an All Ireland C campaign to look forward to. So, chances for uh, guys to get more game time at inter inter county level. Uh, building towards next year and beyond for, for many of those who are still, of course, under 16. And the under 20s, John, we have our first uh, piece of silverware of the early under 20 footballers, a, a, a Munster B title against Waterford. Um, it's welcome. It's been a very tough year for Limerick football in terms of results, um, you know, across the across the grades. But um, it's it's always nice to pick up silverware. It's it, had, it was going back to the great Liam Kearns team that had won, the, I suppose, the... The, the A title, as it were, uh, at, at under 21 level back in 2000. So a nice br gap uh, bridged and nice to get a bit of silver for the football uh, cohort uh, in Limerick. Absolutely, Tam. Yeah, look, it, it's not a title, you know, that 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 you're aiming for at the start of the year. You're hoping to take on the likes of Cork and Kerry uh, at, at the A level. But that's where Limerick, Limerick's under 20 side found themselves this year in, in that new uh, competition as such and you know look it, it is silverware and Shane Kelly would have been a, a very happy man to pick up that silverware as well I've, I've no doubt um, it, it, it look you know Lim Limerick football has, a, has had a tough couple of years we had a minor B win last year of course in, a, in an epic contest against Tipperary down in Mallow you know that was the first first uh, silverware at that grade since the 60s again not exactly the way you want to be but the reality of it, of it is and the future of the provincial championships are what they are. You know, teams need to be playing against teams at their own level at, at, at every age group, not just at senior level, where, where all the talk is of it at the moment. And and that reality is that Limerick aren't at that level at, at minor, um, at, at 20s and, and at senior level at the moment. They can't compete with the likes of Cork and Kerry. And that's, that's just basic arithmetic of, of where things have gone in recent years. You know, you do have... Clare now in Division 3 next year, Limerick in the, at senior level, Limerick it's, uh, in Division 4 and Waterford and Tip in Division 4 as well. So that, that's where Limerick football is right now. You know, there's no two ways about that. But greed shoots, Tom, and that's what you're looking for at these things. And that win for the 20s, you know, against a Waterford team who probably needed the silverware that bit more given what's going on in Waterford football outside of that victory over Tip in the Munster Championship a couple of weeks ago. It's a huge, huge victory for Limerick football. And you, you take what you can get and Shane Kelly and his management team, that group of players, will take huge confidence from that. No question about that. You've seen the likes of Emmett Richter and Dara Murray already have senior, you know, experience with Limerick senior footballers. And there's plenty of other players in that group that are 20s again next year that will be looking to push on even further. So positive and it's great to see Limerick winning any, any silverware. But when they're winning silverware at any level of football, it can only be a positive. Yeah, Aaron Neville, the uh, Newcastle Westman, uh, another who was, I suppose, at the early part of the year involved with the senior side. So uh, uh, good to see him. He got two goals on the night as well. Um, the 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 by product, the by the, the byproduct as well, of course, is um, that Limerick get into an All Ireland series. Now we don't know who they're playing yet. I believe it's going to be Leinster opposition, uh, one from each province into an All Ireland semi final, and. Um, I tell you, I can't remember the last time. It's uh, probably again going back to 2001 since they were contested a football All Ireland semi final. So we, we're not going to sneeze at that. We're not going to look at that lightly. A great opportunity. Two more games for these guys. So um, I'm sure that that's keeping things going. Obviously, their season would have been over if they'd lost. So it's keeping things going now into, into mid May, I think, at least. Yeah, Tom, look, it's fantastic that this group of players, and again, I've said this, I said this last week. They're getting more games at this level. It can only be a good thing. Playing inter-county games against players of similar ability is what these players need because when they get exposed to it at a further level at senior, which a lot of these players will, you know, they're already in, in some ways ingrained into playing teams from other counties. And it's massive, Tom. That experience, and you, you mentioned the, the minor team, the under-17s as well. Yeah, they're learning harsh lessons. I said that last week, the defeat to Waterford, another harsh lesson. But what you hope from, from a supporter's point of view, from our point of view, and of course management point of view, is that they're learning these lessons. They're taking heed of what works of what do, and what doesn't work as a player. And of course, you're hoping the management teams are learning from these defeats as well. But from, from the 20s point of view, it's inviting. Look, it can maybe a be all Ireland. They'll be going all out to win it, and rightly so, because the, the silverware for Limerick football doesn't come around that often, as I've already said. And if they can get past what it, with the Leinster opposition as you have it, you know, into an All Ireland final. It's an All Ireland final. End of story. And they'd be going all all hell for leather to win it. I was there in two thousand with the with the twenties in All Ireland under twenty one A final as it was against a, a famed Tyrone team. And if it wasn't, as people in history will know, Brian Begley's 
shot thunderbolt off the crossbar that cannon. I think it's gone up to midfield now in in lower. How far that that ball cannoned out of uh, after hitting the crossbar. And I think it was Stephen O'Neill, the famed Tyrone footballer, that went up and got the score. That kind of clinched things for Tyrone that day and, and the result of that rebound. But look, if they can get to a final, it would be a massive, massive achievement. But as, as we were speaking about it, Ireland, if you can get to a final, any final, you know, you want, you're there to win it, Tom. And, and hopefully Shane Kelly and his lads can do that. Yeah, they've already played four games, guaranteed a fifth, and we'll be hoping for a sixth. So that uh, can only be positive for uh, those young players. Uh, from of course now and into the future uh, so we that's going to be uh, middle of May so we'll pick that up in a couple of weeks uh, when we have uh, the fixture details uh, flipping to Komogi with uh, no LGFA this week uh, quite weak for them as they build up towards the, the Munster uh, Championship as it were the Komogi front uh, no senior action but uh, the minors are in action this Saturday just to mention their fixture uh, which is a minor All-Ireland A Shield semi-final where they face Dublin of course Limerick uh, topped their group, went straight to the semi-final and had to wait it out for uh, Dublin to win through. So in the rag, in which is in Tipperary, Sunday at 2pm, and uh, I'm sure the ladies would appreciate any, any support and hopefully, a bit like last season, a place in the All-Ireland final awaits. Uh, just to mention as well, last week, uh, John, we had a great win for the, the 16 Camogie that was in Feathered. Uh, they defeated Cork uh, back-to-back champions for Limerick with We've uh, got used to it with the senior hurdlers, but we're just not used to it at any any other grade, really. I can I, I think it's fair to say. Uh, but back to back Munster under sixteen A Camogie titles. That's uh, that's pretty special for uh, for I think the captain was Orna Barrett. Yes, Orna Barrett here of Nakaderi. So great occasion for the for the ladies backing up last year's success uh, by collecting another another cup. Yeah, Tom, massive, massive congratulations to Dear Mid Ryan and and his backroom team with that. It it, it was a huge victory to be Cork. For the first time ever, at and win an A title last year, but to follow it up then with to win another one, I beaten Cork again in that final. It just massive for for the future of Limerick Camogie. And you mentioned the the, the minor team, you know, to get to an All Ireland, I'll be a B Shield final or A Shield final last year when they were so close to get Centrum. I was down in Nolan Park for that game, and and my God, it could have been a very very different result ultimately. Antrim pulling away in the end. But so many of that team from last year's 16s have transferred up to that minor team and so many left behind that have, have, have stood up for the 16s this year. Just fantastic to see, Tom. It really, really is. You know, th- th- there's a bit of a good good feeling factor around Limerick Camogie at the moment with the senior team comfortably, you know, this year. And unlucky in, in, in against, you know, a horror trip to Antrim is, uh, for those that are in the know and, and the fact that they even play that game against Antrim given that the bus had crashed on the way up players getting injured on well very difficult circumstances and still having to go out and people were looking at the scoreline when they lost to Antrim saying geez that's a, that, that's a very surprising result well they didn't know the whole the whole story with it going up but you, you know I, I just think and with the juniors going so well under the tutelage of of, of Dave Deedy as well just that two senior teams or senior junior team minor team going well and, and now the 16 team just following up again this year it's fantastic and again we offer a heartiest congratulations to all involved yeah uh john it looks like what you're saying there and it seems to me that the momentum and i i use that word maybe with matt at the, the turn of the year about limerick Camogie, oh, they need a the momentum and they probably need a consistency and i think we're starting to see that now in the underage ranks um 16s obviously back to back that's that's momentum and that's consistent minors as well back back in the the latter stages and obviously now when you just need to see the seniors and juniors you know start to, to roll with it as well but it's it's uh it, it's starting to turn i think it's fair to say after maybe a lean couple of couple of years oh absolutely tom yeah look look bringing joe quaid back with the management team he's put together you know what was seems to have been you know a catalyst for for certainly for better success for them albeit no no silverware but Securing their Division One status in the league as a starting point, not being in a relegation final like they were last year and the previous year when they struggled as well. So that that was a positive number one. David Eady's side getting to an All Ireland Junior um, semi final last year and unlucky not to come out victorious to that. Yes, green shoots. I'll use that again, but definitely a bit of tide turning. And without that youthful talent, we'll be making this step up. Initially to the junior panel, you would imagine in the next year, some of them were already on the senior panel from last year's Camogie minor side, you know. So that's the likes of Niamh Brennan from a hand being one off the top of my head, but I know there's more. You know, the, those players making that step up immediately, Tom, is only good for both the, the minor teams, the 16s initially, 16s minor, 
junior, senior. That pathway is massively important for the future of Limerick Camogie. And for, for finally, for the first time, as you said, in a good few years, that pathway is there and everyone seems to be working together to get Limerick Camogie back to where it belongs. And that can only be a positive. Yeah, brilliant, brilliant. Well, congratulations to the man. Obviously, at 16, and hopefully not the minors, we'll have an All-Ireland final to look forward to after Sunday's game with Dublin. Uh, John, I think that just about covers us. Um, I uh, hope you enjoy the game in Ennis Sunday. Don't be getting into any uh, skirmishes now with the, our, our friends our friends like Owen there now and all the rest of it. But uh, hopefully uh, for yourself and indeed anyone else going to the game, they enjoy it. And uh, hopefully a very, very exciting year following the Limerick Curlers on the drive for five. And hopefully a long year, of course, and indeed a successful one. So we'll chat you very soon on Treaty Talk. Just to give a plug as well to uh, a chat I had yesterday uh, during the week uh, with Donico Callahan, the referee. Uh, some nice insights there into the black cards and maybe a greater understanding for those of you out there if indeed we do see black, yellow or red cards at the weekend uh, from some of the new rules. So uh, that's on the Sporting Limerick channels. Do do uh, give it a watch about 20 to 25 minutes of your time. Uh, she'll cover that one and uh, we shall chat.